I would like to welcome Dr. Roger Matson, who is going to do our next presentation. Now, Dr. Roger J. Matson is the author of the recently published book, Stealing the Bomb, How Denial and Deception Armed Israel. We'll take questions in a bit, sir. Can we get a question card over to this guy with his hand up, or can he give you one? Uh, we'll be collecting those and bringing them up. Have a uh, Q&A at the end. Dr. Roger Matson has experience in engineering and management at Sandia National Laboratory, the Atomic Energy Commission, the Nuclear Regulatory Commission, the Environmental Protection Agency, and several other nuclear safety and security consultancies. He was advisor to the Nuclear Regulatory Commissioners on policy issues such as safety goals, risk assessment, nuclear standards, Three Mile Island, and after leaving government service in 1984, he led two private companies that provided safety and security services for U.S. nuclear power plants, the Energy Department's nuclear facilities, and several foreign users of nuclear power. Following the Chernobyl incident in 1986, he helped develop IAEA guidance on safety principles for the world's nuclear power plants. He oversaw nuclear safety consultancies in five countries. He also served on the off-site safety committees for several nuclear power plants and several DOE nuclear facilities. In 2012, he was part of a team formed by the American Society of Mechanical Engineers to forge a new safety construct for nuclear power after the tragedy at Fukushima. He has participated in safety analyses and field surveys of nearly 150 nuclear facilities in the US, Europe, the former Soviet Union, and the Far East, including the startup of the latest US nuclear power plant in 2015. Roger? just say a couple things at the start to get us uh, rolling. Uh, this is a complex story that I'm going to tell you today. It's uh, been ongoing for about 60 years, as you will learn, and it's come into the public light in um, kind of a random way. We learn a little bit here, we learn a little bit there. So it was hard for me to piece it together over the years, and I had uh, assistance from Grant and some of his uh, FOIA requests, and I'll show you some of those later. There's some science involved in this story, so if I, I'm trying not to go over your head on the science, but the science is important to the story. So if you have questions about that, send a card up and we'll see if we can answer it at the Q&A session. Um, I'm gonna cover a lot of territory. When I was in China helping them start their first nuclear regulatory authority, I learned a phrase about moving fast through a subject. They call it watching the flowers from horseback. So today we're gonna to watch some flowers from horseback, if you get my meaning. There's some new information in what I'm gonna talk about that's never been talked about publicly before. Uh, it's in the book, and uh, we'll uh, point it out as we come to it. I started uh, an interest in this subject uh, the theft of nuclear materials from the United States to jumpstart the Israeli nuclear weapons program in 1977 when I was asked to lead a group of uh, NRC, Nuclear Regulatory Commission, uh, security experts uh, to look at the charges by a whistleblower, one of our colleagues at the Nuclear Regulatory Commission. Over the years, as more information became available, I learned that I hadn't been told everything the government knew at the time it set me up to, uh, to conduct that investigation, so I had a certain curiosity in it. There were a couple congressional investigations following the whistleblower activity, the most important of which was led by Mo Udall, a Democrat from Arizona, and his records became available in recent years at the University of Arizona Library, which uh, were a vital source to me. We're going to hear in the story about a man named John Haddon, a CIA um, uh, person. He was um, station chief for CIA in Tel Aviv at the time of um, this event. Uh, his son made his records available to me about two years ago after his father's death. Um, 
and they proved invaluable, as you'll see from quotations I'll provide from there. And then in 2006, the Department of Energy declassified some technical information about um, the uranium that was stolen and it helped put the whole story together. So some of this broke very late compared to when it happened. Let me say a couple things about Israel's nuclear program. The first reactor built in Israel was supplied by the United States under President Eisenhower's uh, Adams for Peace program. Some of you are probably old enough to remember that. It was an attempt by the um, uh, Eisenhower administration to stay in the lead over the Soviets in the distribution of nuclear technology in the world. And a small research reactor was built at Nahal Sarek in Israel. About the same time, because the United States refused to provide a plutonium production reactor, the, is, uh, the Israelis made a deal with the French that had its genesis in the Suez Canal crisis and the support that the Israelis provided for the French in that affair. And they um, obtained on the QT uh, the design and fabrication of a reactor at a place called Demona in Israel. Uh, the French provided not only the reactor and the fuel, but also the reprocessing plant from which plutonium could be extracted for making nuclear weapons. An important part of the Israeli program was an organization called LACM, which is a Hebrew acronym uh, for uh, a security organization. I think it was the Scientific Bureau or something that it stood for. Um, these people were charged with espionage around the world, mainly centered in the United States, to steal materials, components, and information about um, nuclear uh, weapons production capabilities. Uh, they were also the people that befuddled the um, inspectors sent by President Kennedy and for a time by President Johnson to look into Demona <clears throat> to try to confirm the Israeli claims that it was a research reactor, not a weapons production reactor. Uh, there's a Ministry of Defense organization called Raphael, another Hebrew acronym that you'll see show up in the chronology as I go through it. Just to give you a time reference, uh, historians believe today, scholars believe today that the first Israeli nuclear weapons were available for use at the time of the Six Day War in 1967, to try to give you a time reference. This next slide is a quick picture of Demona. It's hard to see much on that slide. I just point out that on the right hand side is the usual reactor containment dome that you're used to seeing at other uh, nuclear plants, I think in the middle of their cooling towers, force draft cooling towers, and then the uh, tower on the far left would be for gaseous effluents from a plant. An important thing to remember, these plants all have radioactive effluents. So the company that was involved in the diversion of materials to Israel was a, a company called NUMAC, Nuclear Materials and Equipment Corporation. And the next couple slides provide a timeline for Numex operation. It left something off of the start. Um, in 1955, there was a Geneva Conference on Peaceful Uses of Atomic Energy, where people from developing nations that hadn't been involved in the uh, Manhattan Project and um, the bomb production capability of the United States in World War II first came together to talk about, under the Atoms for Peace kind of uh, dialogue, what they wanted to do with nuclear energy. And Israel was a uh, uh, prime attendee at that meeting in the, in the person of Ernst David Bergman, who went on to become the father of the Israeli atomic bomb. He was the chairman at that time of the Israeli Atomic Energy Commission. And Bergman turned out to be a, a close uh, colleague of a man named Zalman Shapiro. Shapiro is an American uh, Jew uh, from the Pittsburgh area who is a world-famous um, nuclear metallurgist. He knew a lot about uranium. He knew a lot about plutonium. He knew a lot about how to clad uh, fuel elements, how to make fuel elements for reactors. And he learned those things in the United States Nuclear Navy program. He designed um, the first nuclear submarine for the United States, the Nautilus. 
His neighbor in the Pittsburgh area was a man named David Lowenthal. Lowenthal was um, a hero, really, of the 48 War, the War of Independence in Israel. He was on the Exodus, the ship the Exodus, taking refugees to, uh, to Israel after World War II. He was a confidant of Ben-Gurion. Um, he, was one, he organized the funding for the company called Numec. Zalman Shapiro became the president of Numec. He left uh, U.S. government employment at Bettis Atomic Power Laboratory and started the company Numec. It started processing highly enriched uranium for the U.S. Navy in 1960. By 1964, the Oak Ridge National Laboratory people were learning that there was missing uranium, what they call inventory differences or material unaccounted for at the Numec facility in Apollo, Pennsylvania. Um, the uh, Oak Ridge people, remember Oak Ridge is the first uranium enrichment capability in the world built during World War II. Oak Ridge alerted the Atomic Energy Commission then under the leadership of Dr. Glenn Seaborg, Nobel laureate for the discovery of plutonium. Um, the AEC did an independent audit, used the best people they could find, the best people from Oak Ridge, best people from the Commission, best people from NUMEC, and they came up with 178 kilograms of missing highly enriched uranium. Of that 178, they found that 94 kilograms could no way be accounted for. Over the next year or so, NUMEC borrowed $2.2 million to pay for the 178. They had to pay for it all, whether it went up in the air or whether it went someplace that nobody knew about. In 1967, being in uh, dire financial straits, NUMEC sold um, to Atlantic Richfield Company, an interesting sale that Grant wrote about in an earlier book. Uh, that coincided with Atlantic Richfield Company's first entry into the nuclear business. It got a $30 million a year contract at the Hanford Works in the state of Washington, sort of uh, coincidentally with its purchase of New Mech. And some people uh, can't visualize um, how this New Mech facility in Apollo, was it a great big thing or a little bitty thing? Here's a kind of scale. It's about two stories tall. It's about a block and a half long. That's the factory in the top photo, and the bottom photo is the office building across the street, which figures in the story. So the inventory difference grew to 287 kilograms. For those of you who think in terms of pounds, that's about 600 pounds of missing highly enriched uranium. Think 10 to 20 pounds to make um, an atom bomb. Then in 1968, Something that's on the cover of my book, and we'll see here in a minute, is um, records of the four senior espionage officials, espionage agents of the government of Israel, visited Numec under false credentials. In 1970, Shapiro left Numec, went to work for a company called Koweki Barilko, which made beryllium components for nuclear weapons, supplied the beryllium, which is used in a variety of ways in nuclear weapons. He applied for a higher security clearance than the one he had. He got involved with the Nixon administration and Attorney General Mitchell. Some of you will remember John Mitchell. And Mitchell said, no, don't give him a security clearance. It was after the Oppenheimer trial where Oppenheimer lost his security clearance. Seaborg didn't want to go through that again. With Shapiro, they fought back and forth between the AEC and the Justice Department, and in the end, AEC found him a job where he didn't need a security clearance, and it paid $10,000 a year more than what he was making, and he took that job at Westinghouse, which, where he spent most of the rest of his career. In 1971, Babcock and Wilcox Company, that's the people who designed Three Mile Island, by the way, bought Numec from Atlantic Richfield Company. They stopped operations in 78, the plant was decommissioned, returned to a greenfield by 1992, but it had a waste disposal site a few miles away that is now the subject of a Superfund cleanup by the United States government to the tune of $400 million, uh, organized by the Corps of Engineers, and the uh, costs are being negotiated by the Justice Department. 
Okay, that's the story of NUMAC. Go back to the audit in 1965, the 178 kilograms that was missing, 94 kilograms unexplained. The NRC historian has recorded that as six atomic bombs, uh, maybe a little more. There was no FBI investigation of the theft, the alleged diversion in 1965 or 66. The AEC under Dr. Seaborg said that they didn't think it had been stolen. They didn't know where it went for sure, but it didn't think it had been stolen. Uh, if you look at the records of their discussions, the commission discussions with their staff, there's no discussion whatsoever of uh, Dr. Shapiro's association with Israel. Uh, there was a suspicion, they, uh, they, but they didn't talk in any detail about those associations. I'll give you some of that detail in a minute. They had various explanations for where the material went. Um, none of it um, panned out. They dug up things in waste disposal. They, did, uh, they counted filters at Oak Ridge Laboratory. They couldn't find you know, 94 kilograms. That's 200 pounds of highly enriched uranium. Later, Seaborg wrote a number of books, and he wrote three of them that were memoirs where he discussed uh, NUMEC. And in one of them, he, he said, uh, what good would it do to admit that HEU had been stolen and given to Israel? <laughs> he denied that it happened, but he said, what good would it do? So uh, Dr. Shapiro was um, a Zionist. He was an, a national officer in the Zionist Organization of America. He was an awardee of uh, the ZOA. Um, he told both the FBI and the AEC when they uh, took, uh, had hearings with him that, that he wanted to immigrate to Israel. Finally, in a wiretap, uh, the F FBI picked up uh, his admission that the Israelis told him he was more valuable to them here than he was there. Um, you can read down this slide. You can see it on the web later. He was associated with Bergman, the founder of um, the father of the Israeli bomb, a, a number of uh, Lackham agents, people from Mossad. We're going to talk about Rafi A. Tan in a minute. Um, and those are some of his associations. One of the keys to understanding how this happened was that the CIA, beginning in 1966, 67, 68, thought Israel had the bomb. But they hadn't confirmed that Demona was producing plutonium. And so they charged the CIA station chief, John Haddon, and his people in Tel Aviv to make trips to Demona and collect samples in the environment. Remember the gaseous effluents. At any nuclear plant, you can pick up very small traces of radioactivity. That's why they're so closely regulated, to keep those traces uh, very small. So they were looking for plutonium in the environment. And John Haddon's son remembers going out there with his dad on peanut butter sandwich trips, where the kids would eat the peanut butter sandwich, and the father would collect uh, flora in the, in the vicinity, throw it in the trunk, and head back to Tel Aviv. We don't know today who counted those, did the radioactive analysis of those samples, but they found highly enriched uranium before they found plutonium. And there was no highly enriched uranium at Demona. Israel had no capability to enrich uranium. What we know today is that they were able to put a signature on that highly enriched uranium that proved that it came from the United States, that it came from the Naval Nuclear Program because the fuel for Navy fuel for Navy reactors was 97.7% enriched. Uh, a little science, natural uranium, 0.7%. Uranium in a light water reactor, power reactor like we use, 3%. Uranium in a nuclear weapon, typically 93%, depending on the country. But the naval fuel was 97.7, and that's what Haddon found in the environment near Demona, the type of fuel processed by NUMEC. This is what's on the cover of the book. In uh, 1968, these four Israeli spies showed up at NUMEC. And um, just briefly, uh, Avraham Hermoni was the Lackham chief in the United States. He um, uh, recruited a number of spies for Israel in the nuclear program. He went back to Rafael, where he was a deputy director of that weapons effort in Israel. 
Ephraim Begun was um, uh, sort of the technician of Shin Bet, the Israeli FBI. Abraham Bender went on to be the head of Shin Bet. Raphael A. Tan went on to be the head of LACM and recruited and ran Jonathan Pollard in the United States. They visited uh, Numec in 1968, and there were various stories they created. Um, in the book, you'll read my assessment that what they were really there for was to uh, enlist Shapiro's help with um, the um, fabrication of fuel for Demona using uranium they stole from um, the Western Europeans. I'm going to skip the next couple slides. And there's an eyewitness account of the theft that's discussed in the book that the FBI did not follow up on, and we today don't know why. And then I'm going to talk about what various people concluded. And Grant, please bear with me, and I'll be done. J. Edgar Hoover said, remove his clearance, take away all of his contracts. Four attorneys general touched it, Ramsey Clark, John Mitchell, Edward Levy, and Griffin Bell. They said, don't give him any more clearances. They did wiretaps. They um, said more was needed. And then by 1980, the whole thing ended. Seaborg said, what good did it do to, to admit? Uh, Morris Udall said that if he had to write in an envelope whether it happened or not, having finished his investigation and the penalty for uh, being wrong was death, he would write in his envelope that it happened. Um, other politicians have been slow to um, uh, say. Richard Helms said we did the job and avoided political risk. God knows what Richard Helms met in his, uh, <laughs> in his biography. Um, Zbigniew Brzezinski just last year when presented with documents that Grant found said, well, something did transpire. It's explosive. It's controversial. What do you want me to do? Ask him to give it back? <laughs> um, so enough, enough from me. There are lots of implications of this business of a policy nature. Um, my conclusion is the, the, the material went there. Whether Shapiro was actually present when it happened, it's hard to prove. They tell me about arson. If you don't see the match held to the flame, it's hard to make an arson conviction. I think it, the Justice Department had the same trouble here. And finally, I would say that New Mex not alone, that Lackham and Raphael A. Tan, who's still alive, by the way, uh, recruited Arnon Milchan, the famous Hollywood producer. Most recent movie was Revenant. Uh, he did uh, Gone Girl, Birdman. He's one of the wealthiest men in the world was an Israeli spy causing the smuggling of uh, materials and uh, information to their nuclear program for many years. And last but not least, on a deeper understanding level, the Israel lobby impedes frank discussion of Israel on this subject. This book has stuff in that people haven't seen before. And I hope they'll pay attention to it. The Israeli policy of nuclear opacity, uh, denying that they have the bomb when we all know they do, impedes um, frank discussion of weapons-free Middle East, which the Obama administration and others have talked about and we ought to get on with. The only solution to these nuclear weapons things is nuclear disarmament. It's probably a 100-year process. We ought to start today. Thank you. We've encouraged all of our speakers to stay, and we're certainly probably not gonna be able to get to all of your questions on NUMEC or Congress and the making of Middle East policy, but uh, please seek them out during breaks, during the book signings, during uh, other um, opportunities.